Hello. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Zia, for an inspiring talk. Uh, I'm going to uh, give a kind of a segue uh, from the principles that Zia laid out to some of the more uh, contemporary issues that we face today, uh, and also sort of a framing for the talks that follow me, which we'll get into the specifics in more detail. Uh, so I'd like to, to share what are essentially general thoughts about the current state of nuclear proliferation, how it has been changing, largely because of new technology, and then what that means for our ongoing efforts to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons around the world. And I'm going to try to tell this really rather large story through the lens of Iran and North Korea, and hopefully draw out of these two cases uh, some bigger lessons. So let me start with some historical data the blue line here is the number of countries that possess nuclear weapons over time. The red line is the number of countries that are ready to produce a nuclear weapon in relatively short notice. And I define ready here as essentially having either the fissile materials or the technology uh, needed to produce a weapon in hand. And exactly how I define that, of course, would adjust this line somewhat. But the general trend uh, would remain. And what is interesting about this, what really sticks out when I look at this, is that there is a leveling off of both of these lines, right, in recent decades. And that leveling off is probably real, because even at 28 uh, nuclear-ready states, uh, there are still many more countries in the world that could have been added to this chart. So it's not that we are simply saturating. There's, there's something going on that is sort of tamping down on proliferation. And so the question is, what is really responsible for this leveling off? And unfortunately, we don't have a clean answer because, frankly, there are many more variables in this international equation than there are observations, and we can't really extract uh, a real causal explanation from it. But the data do suggest certain insights, and it's, I want to, to explore those. So one of the things is that I would claim that these data suggest that in increasing readiness to make nuclear weapons is not deterministic of proliferation. That specifically the gap between these two lines has been steadily growing. And, and if you imagine a third line on this chart, that would be not the states ready to make nuclear weapons quickly, but the states that with some modest research program could eventually get there, you know, that line would probably shoot up even faster than these two. And so these data seem to de-emphasize the role of technology as being deterministic and emphasize in, ex in exchange some non-technical factor that is checking the spread of weapons. That, that could be norms, very much as Zia has just spoken about. It could also be the political and military organization of the world. Uh, but it speaks to the importance of supporting these norms and supporting these uh, uh, political or ar arrangements that, that check the spread. And so, you know, that's why I think it is so important to recognize people like Zia who have sort of worked over their lifetime to keep those in place. But if that were the whole story, my talk would be over now, because something else is also happening in parallel to this. And that is that despite the, the, the efficacy of political uh, and normative barriers, the last few decades have seen an, an easing of the technical barriers to nuclear proliferation. It is becoming easier for the small subset of countries that don't feel normative or political pressures to abstain to get nuclear weapons if they want them. And as a sort of mildly contrived illustration of this, I, I offer this contrasting image where the one on the left is the, uh, one of the first uranium enrichment plants in the United States built to produce nuclear weapons. It covers 44 acres and employed 12,000 people consumed three times the electricity of the city of Detroit, Michigan, when it was built. It's an, an amazing building uh, when it was built, the largest building in the world, and it was capable of producing only 20 nuclear weapons per year. The, a, today, the same capacity can be built using around 2,500 modern gas centrifuges. Those are the silver tubes you see over in the right image. Those are Iran's prototype. A modern gas centrifuge able to a modern gas centrifuge plant able to produce the same number of nuclear weapons as the building on the left can today fit in a room that is uh, 25,000 square feet uh, and would consume less electricity than an office building of the same size. 
And that just illustrates the sort of change in technology that has occurred over these, these last 70 years. And it was once thought that the technology inside these centrifuges were extremely advanced, but that too has changed. The skill required is really more akin to sort of clock making, I would say. And here you can see some components that are arrayed out on a table in, in Iran's program. With computers, many of the challenges in designing uh, this machine can be solved with a minimum of prototyping. And with uh, the required precision can be acquired using computer-aided uh, manufacturing. And even before we had computer-aided manufacturing, we, it really only required basically a really competent machinist to do this. So it's, it's hardly surprising that for a state that maintains just sort of modest organizational capabilities that they can pull off something like this. And that is really borne out by history. If we look at, uh, in this chart, the number of countries that have successfully built on a largely indigenous basis uh, a centrifuge program capable of producing weapons, we see that the average time that states needed to do that was about 24 months. The Australian program, which is sort of in the middle there, I want to point that out because it's actually the largest, or rather slowest, program on record. And one, would, one wants to know why. Well, it turns out the engineers there had uh, no experience in the areas needed. Uh, they received absolutely no outside assistance. And the program started with three people and never employed more than six engineers. And yet they were nonetheless successful in building this capacity in under six years. So to put it another way, building the technology is kind of like three to four PhD dissertations. Right? This is not rocket science. Right? This, is, this is the current state of nuclear proliferation technology. And it's, it's rather a scary thing. So um, we, as a, as a political, or rather our political uh, uh, and policy experts, have been sort of grappling with this new state of affairs. And they've been rather s slow to understand the implications of this technological change, but they are adapting. And I would say that the Iran talks are the first real evidence of uh, serious adaptation. Specifically, it was the first time that the United States was willing to accept that a state of proliferation concern, Iran, could retain its ability to produce a nuclear weapon, albeit at a much slower pace. And that was formalized in what was called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is better known as the Iran nuclear deal. And it's an agreement that basically says to Iran, OK, look, we will let you keep your ability to make a nuclear weapon, but in such a way that if you try it, we'll have enough time to respond and with a military strike if necessary. That's, in essence, what makes the deal work. It's a stable impasse. And in making the agreement, the United States implicitly recognize that an attempt to eradicate Iran's technical capacity to do this was probably a fool's errand. At best, we might have hoped to eliminate the overt elements of the program, but we could not eliminate Iran's knowledge or the skill of its engineers or its people. Right? So even if we had eradicated it, it could have restarted a program secretly somewhere else a few years later. So perhaps in view of that, the, really the best hope was to accept the program, accept that this was within Iran's ability, and to keep it open and operating under international monitoring. And that is, in essence, what the deal did. And this is really a revolutionary idea for foreign policy, because it stood in stark contrast to every sort of nonproliferation strategy that the United States had used from the beginning. Previously, either the United States capitulated, such as in the case of maybe Pakistan, or they really sought to eliminate the technical foundations of nuclear weapons uh, in that country and succeeded, as occurred in South, South Korea, Taiwan, Iraq, Algeria, and, and several others. And the reason why eradication was possible in those cases was because those states largely purchased reactors from third countries and they did not have the indigenous capability to produce weapons on their own, We're not without sig significant work. But that changed with the emergence of the centrifuge, and we have slowly learned to change with it. Let me say a few words about how uh, this stable impasse was reached. Um, 
At the time of the agreement, Iran had two possible routes to a weapon, a plutonium route that was based on nuclear reactors, particularly this reactor, which was called Arap, and a uranium route based on centrifuges that I showed you earlier. And the plutonium route was solved by modifying the design of this reactor such that the rate of plutonium production would be slowed, not eliminated. It's not really possible to eliminate plutonium production, uh, at least not uh, in a way that is nonproliferation compatible. But we could slow it by roughly a factor of eight. And the way that was done was to cut the power of this reactor in half and to shift the composition of the reactor fuel so that the new fuel would contain more uranium-235, which is the greenish line on the top that produces fission and heat, and less of the uranium-238 isotope, which is what converts into plutonium. And so uh, with the reactor so modified, it would now take Iran around six to seven years to accumulate enough plutonium in that reactor to make one weapon. And if you couple that sort of slow motion reactor with an agreement to transfer out of Iran all of the plutonium spent fuel, all the plutonium bearing fuel, on an annual basis, you have a situation where Iran never attains enough plutonium to produce a weapon. And that is the core of this stabilization agreement. And some of the most influential advocates of this idea are actually on this panel today. And I'll, also, I'll particularly point out Frank von Hippel, who really is the one who brought this idea to the attention of the Iranian and US negotiators. For the uranium route, uh, it was much more straightforward. You cut the size of the enrichment program by literally ripping out centrifuges and you cap the amount of low enriched uranium hexafluoride that Iran could have on hand. And so the, the combination of the reduced enrichment capacity and reduced uranium inventory led to a situation where if you run the calculation, it seems like it will take Iran at least a year to rebuild this program and to do the enrichment necessary to produce a bomb using uranium. And so that's what created this stable impasse. Unfortunately, the most substantive provisions that I just discussed uh, expired 10 years after the deal went into effect, which begs the question, what comes next? Well, unfortunately, the Iran deal did not make any progress with respect to this core lesson of our original chart. Right? It did not directly address Iran's motivations for weapons. It did not address the normative barriers to weaponization. What the deal did do on this front was to create a time-limited opportunity to begin that work by relaxing tensions and, and making possible a political rapprochement. The Trump administration decided not to take up that opportunity. It instead withdrew from the Iran deal. Partly this is probably because it was simply Obama's deal and he didn't like it. But uh, it's also partly because the conservative political establishment holds that countries like Iran simply cannot be trusted. And so a political rapprochement is naive. And uh, if you view that as the case, then certainly it makes more sense to treat Iran more like we treated the Soviet Union, to adopt a policy of containment, to use the language of force, and to wait for the state to collapse. And that's what they're doing. In spite of the US political shift, however, Iran and the other five signatories, the UK, France, Germany, Russia, and China, have decided to stay the course, which is, at least for people like me, good news. They have sustained the agreement, and so I think the prospect for this rapprochement might exist post-Trump, although we will have lost four years of the 10 uh, in a state of intransigence. So for now, this Iran situation seems relatively stable probably we won't make much progress, regardless of which philosophy you wish to adopt. The situation in North Korea, however, is very different. For one, they already have a nuclear weapon, right? It's different. But more significantly, their nuclear program did not grow up under IAEA supervision in the way that Iran's program did. And as a result, unlike Iran, we really have no idea about the whole extent of the program. And what that means is that an Iran-like approach in which we attempt to negotiate some kind of technology management plan, which is essentially what the JCPOA is, uh, that's not going to work because we don't have any sense of how to calibrate its strategic significance. Instead, we are facing the question of how to reverse 
a nuclear weapon program of unknown size, built at unknown locations with unknown numbers of people, and to find a way to ensure that every last scrap of the program, every last kilogram of plutonium and highly enriched uranium has been accounted for in the country. And we really have n almost no starting point for doing this, which makes it incredibly difficult. While some argue that, look, this idea is simply a fool's errand, it's too difficult, we should instead, again, work to contain North Korea. And that could be done through arms control agreements, it could be done through agreements that reduce the probability that they will use nuclear weapons, it could be done through the threat of force and escalation. So what are the prospects for these different uh, approaches? Well, I think that depends largely on how you view whether or not there is a zone of possible agreement for diplomacy. Right? Until you understand that, you really can't evaluate the value of it. So many people, when thinking about North Korea, they start from the position that there is no such zone of, of agreement. Because, well, let's face it, the North Korean regime has a long history of lying and cheating, and Kim Jong-un is just the latest brutal dictator to head this regime, if not one of the worst, since he is the person who killed his uncle and half-brother and brought nuclear weapons to the forefront of North Korea's foreign policy. And indeed, if that is a complete understanding of the situation, then I would agree that a policy of pressure leading to containment might be the best you could do. But I, I think there's more to the story. I see things a little differently with North Korea. I see growing evidence that North Korea is undergoing a real shift under Kim Jong-un. And you see, although Kim Jong-un did begin his reign with displays of power, purging these internal challengers and fast-tracking nuclear weapons development, one has to remember that he came to power at the tender age of 28. He had real challengers who were after his position from the military, and he had to find ways to cement his authority over what was already a rather cutthroat regime. But then after these public displays of aggression, Within the first year, we see noteworthy changes in his behavior. He uh, notably overturned his father's uh, central organizing policy for the country, which was called Songun, which means the military always comes first. And he replaced it with a new policy called Gyeongjin, which means the parallel development of the economy and the military together. And then following that, he began to steadily diminish the role of the military in state affairs. So for example, we saw that the military officials shown in the picture on the left, who always appeared really next, close to him in any, any kind of uh, public setting, began to get pushed to the back of his entourage. And instead we see standing the closest to him, his economic advisors, which is a rather dramatic change over how this uh, regime had operated. In May 2016, the young Kim convened a party congress. Is that important? It was the first such party congress in 36 years in North Korea. And in, at that congress, he outlined in a speech uh, that scientific research and technological innovation, not military discipline, would be the central motive force for national progress, which was a radical departure from the type of speeches that his father had given. And then in April of 2018, he made a number of uh, pretty dramatic announcements. Not only did he commit to no more testing of nuclear armaments, he said that his transitional policy of Byung-jin, this, this two-track approach of military and the economy, was now complete. And that the new policy of the country would be to devote all available resources to building a stable economy. <laughs> In a centrally controlled society like North Korea, that rhetoric actually has some meaning. It's worth paying attention to, but you don't really have to take his word for it because there's also evidence of change on the ground. Since Kim Jong-un took over, there is a new urban services economy emerging in North Korea. The number of official shops where average citizens can buy basic goods has doubled. Markets are formally organized so that vendors can start businesses and rent stalls from the government. This is starting to look more like capitalism than communism. There are multiple private taxi cab lines that now compete for business in the capital city of Pyongyang. And the government has really prioritized tourism, dumping enormous amounts of money 
into hotel complexes and beautiful areas, hoping to welcome outsiders and their cash. And while all that may seem mundane to an American who is used to living in a capitalist society, this is really a different strategy than merely expanding the counterfeiting and arms dealing and smuggling operations that has been used to prop up this regime for decades. So why? Why this change? Well, it might be that this Swiss-educated young man seeks a more modern society like the one that he grew up in. He may also understand that his country's economic stability, and by extension, the survival of his regime, depends on him finding some controlled way to engage with the outside world. And we see that evidence because he has turned to China and to South Korea to forge economic deals. And he has shown himself, and this comes from diplomats who were in meetings uh, with Moon and Kim and with Xi Jinping and Kim, that he has shown himself to be an incredibly competent and deferential interlocutor. And he has even tolerated some very bombastic declarations from the President of the United States with incredible poise. All right? and so I don't propose that we merely trust this new Kim nor assume that North Korea's nuclear ambitions are over, but I do see Kim as a leader with whom we might productively engage. And that is because I believe he has a genuine interest in economic development. And to my mind, that provides us with a point of leverage with which we might begin to have a productive dialogue about nuclear weapons. And indeed, I would say that the offer made by North Korea at the recent uh, summit in Vietnam uh, simply under, underlines that as the likely reality. But the basic technical facts remain that Iran is, and North Korea are very different, and we have no idea how big North Korea's program is, as illustrated by all these satellite photos annotated with possible tunnel entrance to possible military facility here and there, and guesses made by analysts, but no on-the-ground hard evidence. So given our state of ignorance, it's not really possible at this point in time to negotiate uh, a meaningful series of walkbacks, because we really have no idea how to calibrate any offer that North Korea might make us. We don't understand the strategic significance of this or that facility, absent a larger sense of the program. Some favor, as a starting point, then a complete declaration of all facilities. I do not favor that because, well, one, we would never and should never trust any declaration by an adversary as being complete. But, but two, it would simply become a, a target list and an opportunity to accuse North Korea of being less than truthful at some future point. Another option to deal with this problem is radical transparency. But I, I don't believe that Kim is prepared to accept inspectors crawling around his country. Uh, and anyone who suggests this as a policy is probably doing so in the hopes that it will be a poison pill. So in my view, what is needed is a solid first step, something that outlines the concerns of both sides clearly, followed by slow engagement over many, many years in which we can learn about North Korea's program, much in the same way that the FBI learns about past crimes through in investigations. It talks to people, it works with people, and slowly information emerges, and you begin to piece it together. And we can imagine doing this by starting, for example, uh, a collaboration with North Korea on nuclear safety issues. Or perhaps we could begin collaborating in areas of basic physics, uh, and using some of its scientists and nuclear facilities to do that. And one of our speakers on the panel, Rachel Carr, will talk about some opportunities in that area later today. And then to complement this sort of engagement, it would be useful to develop a set of new forensic capabilities, what we call nuclear archaeology, so that we could go, well, if we get access to facilities through this collaborative effort, that we can then go and reconstruct the history of those facilities and learn how they have been operated, how much highly enriched uranium or plutonium they have produced in those facilities, so we don't simply have to take North Korea's word for it. And that's the work that I do in my lab at MIT. And finally, it will help to establish a set of fair-minded international policies 
that can be applied to govern the production of highly enriched uranium and its use, the operation of centrifuge plants, in such a way that it alleviates international concern around this technology that has complicated everything, right? And in keeping with the view that this should be done in a way that advances international norms, they should be universally applicable to all states, not just designed for Iran or North Korea. And Frank von Hippel, I think, is going to talk more about some of these ideas later today in his talk. So to recap, we are living in a different world, one in which, yes, most states have responded positively to efforts to end proliferation of nuclear weapons, but also a world in which the states who fall through the cracks are now able to make nuclear weapons more easily, which puts an incredible emphasis on responding quickly and appropriately when those countries declare their interest in nuclear weapons. And I argue that this requires a new kind of non-proliferation strategy, one rooted in an understanding that you can no longer count on or somehow render states technically inept, that you must accept that this is a reality for all states and instead negotiate with that understanding. And if the strategy is indeed to be rooted in diplomacy rather than regime change, it makes sense to find ways to get to the negotiating table quickly, to work cooperatively, to reduce threats, and not necessarily going for a broke and a huge package at the outset, and to, as physicists, build technologies that will help us reconstruct forensically uh, the past activities of these programs and to verify non-proliferation and disarmament efforts around the world. This is a slower, more laborious, and more challenging sort of non-proliferation strategy than one we are used to, but I think I would argue it's the world we live in now. And that, I'll say thanks very much. Uh, Scott finished well within his time, so there's plenty of time for questions, discussion. Uh, people who would like to raise any questions, please go to the two microphones that are set up. Bill. Uh, yes, could you comment on the, the other side of it, the flip side, the sanctions re regime? And what do you think might have been accomplished? Uh, what could the U.S. have given up in terms of ratcheting down the sanctions to, uh, to meet the North Korean needs at this stage and what they laid out in the, in the recent negotiations? I would love to. I, I have uh, flip-flopped over the years on my views on sanctions, which is just to say that there's not a, a very obvious and clean answer. And let me just start a little bit with Iran. I, I was asked to work on the Iran sanctions when I was in the State Department, and I refused. Uh, but in the end, I do believe that the sanctions brought, er, helped bring Iran to the negotiating table, if for no other reason that we had kind of gotten stuck in a kind of we can out-escalate out each other kind of mindset, and the sanctions brought home that there were consequences to this escalation for Iran. But um, in North Korea, uh, the situation is a little different in that it has been more isolated from the international community for longer. In fact, uh, a sort of central organizing philosophy of the entire state uh, is to go it alone. And so for them, uh, I think that sanctions have ha had less uh, impact than they did in Iran. And if you look at the extent of the sanctions that have been passed on North Korea, I mean, really, they are designed to basically cripple the economy as, as much as possible. These are bans on coal, bans on basic mineral exports, complete bans on banking access. It's not just targeted at the weapons program. And, uh, you know, one has to ask whether those sanctions are important to bringing North Korea to the table. Certainly the administration uh, seems to think so, and they are hesitant to give up these broader sanctions. I am somewhat less convinced. I, I think the story is more along the lines of what I narrated, that, that Kim Jong-un actually has begun this, what we call the Olympic peace, beginning in December 2017, for reasons that have less to do with the sanctions and more to do with his own view of the future of the country. Uh, 
So if that is the case, then those sanctions, uh, which are really designed to cripple the economy, might be given up sooner rather than later. And that, in fact, was, as far as we understand, the sanctions that, that North Korea asked to be lifted at Hanoi was the, the most recent five resolutions. And that, were, that was only sanctions on things like the exports of coal and minerals. Right? If the sanctions that they didn't ask to be lifted were sanctions on, their, on importing military equipment and small arms, uh, sanctions related to the inspection of all cargoes going into North Korea related to the nuclear program, and sanctions banning uh, financial and travel uh, access for people associated with the nuclear program. Those were all have remained under North Korea's proposal. So I, I personally, I think I would have accepted what was offered by the North Koreans with some subtle modifications. But if you, if you take the view that really you have to squeeze the economy as a whole hard, then I understand the position that maybe all of those sanctions would have been too much of a give. I don't have a, a, a solid answer beyond that. Yeah. Another question? If not, let's thank uh, Scott Kemp again and uh, Alex Fraser. Do you mind if I ask a quick question? Sure, please, go ahead. We have uh, a minute or two while we're changing uh, the computer and go ahead. So thank you so much for that talk. Um, I was wondering, you spoke a little bit about the Iran deal and uh, you were thankful that it survived despite the US pulling out of it. Uh, so that survival is only because it was a strong multilateral treaty and that there were other actors uh, who were able to keep it alive despite the U.S. leaving. Uh, so I was wondering if you could speak to the importance or relative importance of multilateral institutions, uh, multilateral agreements as compared with bilateral negotiations and uh, uh, even unilateral action by the United States. Do you think the U.S. ought to rely more on multilateral agreements or are uh, bilateral and unilateral uh, options sufficient? Thank you. Uh, that's an interesting question for which I'm not sure I'm qualified really to, to give an answer, because uh, I, I, I'm not a historian of international agreements. But my, I'll just say that my sense is there is a place for all types. Um, for example, uh, there was a very productive unilateral a removal of tactical nuclear weapons by the United States and, and the Soviets uh, that I, I'm not sure could have been easily codified in an agreement. And uh, likewise, uh, I do think the bilateral talks between uh, the United States and Russia are important to remain bilateral for at least a while longer because bringing in a multilateral forum makes, would just complicate things too much. And, and in some sense, even the Iran deal really was a bilateral discussion with other signatories. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, when you are being forward-leaning and there's a chance of reversal, as in the case of Iran, having other countries put their seal of approval and uphold the agreement despite a reversal, I think, is obviously a very good thing. So it's situation-dependent. Let's thank Scott Kemp again and Alex Fraser.